This is an image no one will forget. A second airliner slamming right into the World Trade Center this morning. Millions of people watched it happen on TV. Both of the Twin Towers have now collapsed. At about 10 this morning, a plane crashed near the Pentagon. The nation's capital is now on high alert and all government buildings have been evacuated. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Liz Walker. As you can imagine, there is pandemonium and chaos in the streets of New York. We're going to have Team 4 coverage on this changing situation. Let's begin now with WBZ's national correspondent, Alina Sergani, who's standing by in Washington, D.C. The nation remains on high alert. In New York City, the fear is that the death toll could reach the thousands. Here in Washington, the nation's capital is virtually shut down, and there remains a sense of chaos as everyone tries to get out of town. Smoke and fire continue billowing from the Pentagon hours after a plane crashed into the building. A portion of the Pentagon has collapsed and there are reports of injuries. Witnesses say it looked like a huge orange fireball. Huge explosion uh, and then utter pandemonium as you might imagine. I mean, everybody was screaming, oh my God. People started saying, we've got to turn around, they hit the Pentagon. Much of downtown Washington is in quiet chaos as people scramble to get out of town. Upon word of the news, President Bush returned to Washington. And I've ordered that the full resources of the federal government uh, go to help the victims and their families and, the f and to conduct a full-scale investigation to hunt down and to find those folks who committed this act. And my colleague Gretchen Carlson is covering the very latest from New York City. Here now is her report. Both 110-story towers of New York's World Trade Center collapsed after unknown terrorists attacked the buildings this morning. Two aircraft, about 18 minutes apart, flew directly into the towers just as workers were arriving around 9 a.m. The second attack was captured on videotape showing a large plane smashing into one of the 110-story skyscrapers. The building burst into flames, dropping debris all over the narrow streets of lower Manhattan. Many people are dead. Hundreds are believed to be critically wounded. 50,000 people work in the World Trade Center. I looked up and I saw the second plane hit. It had to be a commercial-sized airliner. What went through your mind? that it couldn't be real. A short time later, when top portions of one of the towers collapsed, Take people up. on the ground were sent running for their lives. Let's get out of here. Officials stopped all flights across the nation. Power uh, to protect the families of the Commonwealth. Governor, you mentioned the importance of two F-15s that were, that were flown to New York airspace. Are those planes still in the air? Do you have other flights that, uh, that are out there? And what can you tell us about what the F-15s are? Um, it, it, we will continue to respond to whatever federal requests there are. Um, my understanding is that the F-15s were requested just as um, a need to create a presence in the New York area. As they assess the situation first thing this morning, uh, it, they will uh, remain at the disposal uh, of a federal request for as long as they deem that necessary. We have had um, some additional uh, requests, but again, um, we mostly right now are assessing what resources we have in Massachusetts, massive resources that might be utilized and will be well utilized in the really chaotic situation as it exists in New York City. I don't want to add uh, to the nature of um, uncertainty and response that's down there. In fact, I want our um, medical personnel, our state police, our uh, firefighters who are particularly um, bothered by uh, reports of what uh, might have transpired in New York uh, to be available when uh, we are called upon and when we're needed because it's going to take um, a great deal of time for things to get back to normal in New York City and they may well need our resources and we want to be available and prepared to respond to requests that might come our way. Governor, what do you think it says that uh, at a time of national tragedy like this, some of our top elected officials were squabbling about a congressional primary? Uh, I think the people who are in charge of the election, the Attorney General, uh, who uh, is our Chief Law Enforcement Officer, and I were in complete agreement uh, that we shouldn't shut down an election in the face of terrorism, and I'm uh, glad that that is, in fact, what happened. Thank you. Uh, the governor mentioned uh, the importance of 
We've been watching uh, Acting Governor Jane Swift addressing the residents of the Commonwealth. This is the second time today that she has come out and spoken from the bunker there in Framingham tonight, saying that families and their needs certainly are at the top of her list. She's hoping to get back to business as usual tomorrow at the State House and says that any kind of resources that are needed to investigate this situation, she will be willing to provide. Sort of interesting. She said that no threats have been made against Massachusetts, but there certainly has been a Boston connection to the tragedies which have gone on today. Two airplanes which left Logan Airport this morning within 15 minutes of each other, both going to Los Angeles. One an American Airlines, one a United Airlines flight, both had overnighted here in Boston. And they are the two planes that hit the World Trade Center towers. That means that terrorists got on board those planes here at Logan Airport. And there's going to be a lot of people discussing uh, some of that information, how in the world they got on. No one knows right now if they use guns, if they simply overpowered the pilots or what. And Jack, we have learned now that authorities are looking for uh, a number of vehicles, two cars with at least two men of Eastern, Middle Eastern descent in the Hanscom area. And nationally, they're looking for a white Chevy van with New Jersey plates. And on the back bumper, it says something to the effect of urban moving system. So uh, all points bulletin out for these vehicles and these individuals. So uh, how they may be connected, none of us actually knows at this point. Those two flights are left from Boston this morning. Uh, the American Airlines flight left just, just before 8 o'clock at 7.59, had 92 people on board. The United Airlines Flight 175, again, both going to Los Angeles nonstop. It left at 8.14 this morning. It was the American Airlines flight that hit the North Tower. That was just before 9 o'clock. And about 10 or 15 minutes later, it was the United Airlines flight from Boston that slammed into the South Tower of the World Trade Center. And what we've seen today, of course, absolutely horrendous. And we've We've had some local victims as well, including all of the crew from the American Airlines flight was from Boston. Yes, and David Robichaud joins us now from Drake, where the pilot of that American Airlines flight uh, called home, and a little bit earlier today, his brother spoke on behalf of the family. David? That's right, Kim. When American Airlines pilot John Oganowski left his beautiful farm here in Drake this morning, he said goodbye to his wife and his three daughters. And then, as is customary, he drove by the home of his parents and his brother, and he honked his horn on the way by. His family learned of the tragedy the same way many of us did on television. Now, John Oganowski is 52 years old. He's a pilot of the American Airlines flight number 11 that crashed into the World Trade Center after being hijacked on the way to L.A. He had been a pilot for American Airlines for 22 years. His wife, Maggie, is also a flight attendant for American Airlines. Now, Oganowski family lives on this 150-acre farm, which John fought hard to preserve, and his brother, Jim, spoke of John's love of land and air. John loved to fly, but more importantly, of course, he loved his family. And John's legacy is where we stand today. There's 150 acres of land here that John fought for many years with the town of Drakeit and the state. There's 150 acres of land here that are gonna remain as we see them today as open space through the Massachusetts Agricultural Preservation Act. So take a good look at the beauty of land around here. That's John's legacy. This is quite a cowardly act what we have seen today uh, attacking civilians, not military. Um, whatever it takes, my, my unit will be involved, and I would like to be the first one to step forward and be involved with that. You can see that flag draped over the doorway there is a sign of patriotism. They put that up, that up just a couple of hours ago. Here in this beautiful 150-acre farm is where the Oganowski family is gathering to mourn John. His brother Jim called him a hero. We'll have more coming up at 5 and 7. For now, live in Drake it, I'm David Robichaud. Back to you. David, thank you. John Oganowski had a co-pilot on that plane, and we understand his name was Tom McGinnis of Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Tom leaves behind a wife, Cheryl, and two teenage children, a boy and a girl. And there has been uh, more than just speculation, but reaction from sources within American Airlines that they just can't believe that somebody like Oganowski would actually be at the controls when it slammed in the World Trade Center. Uh, many people are now saying, uh, again, this is a speculation, but it's pretty good speculation from people who are very familiar uh, with the situation, that uh, obviously somebody overpowered 
the, uh, the uh, plane, the cockpit controls, and took over that flight to slam into there because they can't believe that anyone, including it, a gun at their head, is going to slam a plane into some, a building uh, in which the two buildings uh, house some 50,000 people working this morning in New York. You know, Jack, and that's one of those those things we may never know the answer to. Well, exactly we do know uh, we do know that they can activate a a, a recording system mm -hmm. specifically within the cockpit itself, and that is the same as the black box, which uh, they're able to withstand direct impacts. There is a chance that somewhere in that rubble there is a there that's are it. a couple of uh, black boxes. Mm -hmm. If so, that would have recorded the uh, conversations within the cockpit, but that's uh, weeks, months, perhaps sure. away before we can find out. But meanwhile, that all points bulletin, they are looking, and I'm sure a lot of questions are being asked about security here in Boston. Absolutely. In fact, the high-rises here in Boston all uh, were evacuated today. Robin Hamilton joins us now from Back Bay, where we had lots of people leaving the city today, didn't we, Robin? That's exactly right, Kim. Well, I mean, some of the most prominent uh, buildings in the city here are here, and a lot of people were extremely concerned, and for that reason, they issued, a number of buildings issued an evacuation. I mean, usually, this time of the day, the streets are bustling with activity, but right now, as I'm sure you can see, it is quite quiet and, and almost empty. A number of buildings, including the Presidential Center, as well as the John Hancock buildings, issued an evacuation where thousands and thousands of employees left uh, earlier this morning and as we move over I'm not sure if you can catch it but the flag in front of the Prudential Center is at half staff this gives you an idea and really is just a grim reality of just how far reaching this disaster is our colleague across the hall informed us that uh, one of her co-workers husbands was on that flight that was destined for Los Angeles and I just fell apart. They had just adopted a little baby boy named Rocky, and uh, now there's a life that I know that has been shattered. Now, coming back out here alive again, you can see the flag is at half staff. Overall, just the mood is extremely somber and sad. You can see the streets are pretty much empty, and a lot of people, not only are they sad, but extremely tense. They're very much wondering about some of the friends or relatives or anyone that they knew in uh, D.C. or in New York. So, again, it's just a very tense, tense mood. One more thing I do want to mention. There has been a police presence around here. They're being very tight-lipped about what they are doing or where they exact are staying but uh, we know that there is a presence here just making sure that everything is secure. Back to you. All right, Robin, thank you very much. Uh, you know, showing how busy Logan Airport is on a, um, on a morning like this when all those aircraft are taking off, between 7 and 9 o'clock this morning when the two uh, airplanes were hijacked from Boston, 220 aircraft either landed or took off from Logan Airport, 106 departures, 114 arrivals. Again, the two planes that were hijacked went within 15 minutes of each other today and were diverted toward uh, New York City in those uh, pictures which are absolutely uh, flabbergasted gasting to see uh, there we didn't have a picture of the first one uh, hitting but you can right. see the second one hitting the first one was the American Airlines flight here comes the United comes the Airline mm -hmm. slamming into that second tower and this uh, of course unfolding on live television today this was uh many Americans saw this happen. And, you know, these are really lethal bombs because they picked two planes which were leaving on an uh, across-the-country intercontinental flight, uh, transcontinental flight, I should say, between here and Los Angeles. They were loaded with thousands of pounds of highly volatile fuel and slamming into the air at a rather high rate of speed. And, of course, that plane went deep into the building. Right. And uh, it didn't take long before these two buildings were no more crashing down on a lot of the workers and others there in New York. And the other thing which we've not brought out, which is so true, is that a number of people who are from Boston go to New York on a regular basis. Thousands of people a day are down in New York, the shuttles going back and forth, and no one knows the true extent. That's a massive complex, that uh, World Trade Center, with a lot of meetings scheduled. I know Associated Press was quoting a... Uh, a company from uh, down in Rhode Island that has scheduled a meeting this morning at the World Trade mm -hmm. Center with some of their employees. So mm -hmm. it's going to be some time until we can sort out just the total extent of this massive tragedy, including its ties here to Boston. Right. And keeping in mind, too, what's happening uh, economically. We, we, we won't know that for quite yeah. some time. But uh, keeping in mind that Logan Airport is closed down uh, indefinitely. Um, and at this point, they've actually asked all employees and everyone to leave 
Logan Airport. Uh, any passengers who may have been waiting there for the airport to reopen, they have asked all of them to leave, so the investigation is in full swing there at Logan Airport, and it could be hours and possibly days before Logan Airport is up and running again. Shelly Lockhart is standing by at uh, City Hall Plaza, and Shelly, today non-essential city workers all sent home, but uh, City Hall never really closed down, did it? No, the mayor and his essential personnel were here to kind of monitor the situation around Boston, but if you take a look at City Hall Plaza, it's completely cleared out this afternoon. A lot of people have gone home. Again, as you said earlier, and I just said also, that um, many of the city's non-essential personnel were sent home. It was the same story at the State House earlier today. And as Robin Hamilton told us, it was the same story at many of the high-rises around Boston. Now, that we did have a bomb threat right across the street here from City Hall Plaza, but that turned out to be nothing. But because of things like that, there has been a very high law enforcement and emergency personnel presence all around the city today. Extra people have been called in just to make sure that everything goes well here in Boston. And the officers, of course, are on alert just in case something happens. Of the situation, uh, the department certainly has identified, has been a member of a terrorism task force with other federal and state agencies have identified a number of properties that certainly are a concern. We're taking security precautions around all of those, and certainly uh, we'll be working uh, through the uh, coming days to ensure that uh, the city gets back to business, if you will. But as the mayor has indicated, life has changed. Now the city will have increased staff for police and emergency personnel for the next few days. They're not saying exactly how long everybody has been put on alert, although not every single employee has been called back in. 911 is operating as normal, we're told. All of the emergency programs are working just as normal here in Boston. They may send a medical disaster team, we're told, to New York as early as tonight to help deal with some of the casualties there. And as we get more information on what is happening with Boston City employees and state employees tomorrow, we'll let you know. Reporting live from City Hall Plaza, I'm Shelley Lockhart. Kim, Jack, back to you. Shelley, thanks so much. We were talking about that all-points bulletin for those vehicles a little earlier. We've put that now so on a screen here so you can see it. So if any of this should be familiar to you, again, it's a nationwide all-points bulletin, a wide white Chevrolet van with New Jersey registration on the back of it. It says something about urban moving system or systems written on the back. And again, they're looking for a vehicle uh, with at least two men of Middle Eastern descent. It was in the Hanscom area looking for that vehicle um, here in the Massachusetts area. So. Uh these could be some tips for us. Yes, uh, and also by uh, closing down the airport, I'm sure right now they're trying to figure out if they can determine any breach of security since a number of hijackers. No one knows if weapons were actually brought on board or not. Some 1,500 state-owned buildings were uh, locked and secured today. Now, the governor was indicating she hoped it would get back to business as usual tomorrow, and I was on CBS News about 40 minutes ago during one of the interviews. They said that they hope to have the airports around the country open perhaps as early as noon tomorrow, but it'll be later tonight. Uh, when we'll be able to give you more information on that. One thing we know that will not be business as usual tomorrow is Wall Street. We understand that the trading day has been canceled for tomorrow as well. A reaction around the world on some of the stock markets, of course, has been uh, very rough today. This uh, not only affects the United States, the symbols of uh, capitalism in this country you see actually uh, being uh, blown totally apart there in New York City, these pictures of the World Trade Center towers. Mm. Pictures we'll never forget, Jack. Never. Terrible on uh, September the 11th, ironically, 9-11. Yes, that's uh, right. 9 one, one like the, uh, the emergency call. We're going to be covering this uh, uh, all throughout the night. Uh, we have the 6 o'clock news uh, coming up on WBZ from our local perspective, and then we're working hard to put together all the late information combination of local, national, uh, and international news uh, coming up at 7 o'clock on UPN 38. Mm -hmm. We have lots of coverage yet to come. We hope you'll stay right here with us at WBZ. Thank you for being with us. We're going to send it back to the network now. Minutes later, he made a statement, then got on a plane and said he was heading back to Washington. But as it turned out, the president did not go to Washington. Security concerns were paramount here, and he was taken instead to Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana. And on the ground in Barksdale, he taped a statement, which was later played back for us, and this is what the president had to say 
at that time to the American people. Freedom itself was attacked this morning by a faceless coward. Eric. And freedom will be defended. Eric. I want to reassure the American people that full, the full resources of the federal government are working to assist local authorities to save lives and to help the victims of these attacks. Make no mistake, the United States will hunt down and punish those responsible for these cowardly acts. I've been in regular contact with the Vice President, Secretary of Defense, the National Security Team, and my Cabinet. We have taken all appropriate, appropriate security precautions to protect the American people. Our military at home and around the world is on high alert status. And we have taken the necessary security precautions to continue the functions of your government. We have been in touch with the leaders of Congress and with world leaders to assure them that we will do what is, whatever is necessary to protect America and Americans. I ask the American people to join me in saying a thanks for all the folks who have been fighting hard to rescue our fellow citizens, and to join me in saying a prayer for the victims and their families. The resolve of our great nation is being tested, but make no mistake, we will show the world that we will pass this test. God bless. President Bush, that was the videotape that he made uh, outside uh, Shreveport, Louisiana, his second statement of the day. The earlier one, uh, a, a situation in Florida where he spoke very briefly, it happened uh, about an hour and a half, two hours before that statement was made. Russ Mitchell, who's been helping me here at CBS News World Headquarters in New York, uh, has a development and someone to talk to. Russ? Thank you very much, Dan. And we're here now with Patrick Andre. He works in the 71st floor of building number two at the World Trade Center. He's a trading manager at Morgan Stanley. Mr. Andre, thanks for joining us. You were there yes. when the second plane hit. Describe to me what happened. Um, we were evacuating the 71st floor when suddenly uh, I heard a boom and fire and smoke engulfed the floor, and all the tiles for the, for the ceiling started crumbling down. The tiles from the ceiling? Yeah, from the ceiling started crumbling yeah. And at that point, um, the, the two other uh, co-workers who were with me, we uh, decided to go down the step, the stairs, and uh, leave the building. You went down 71 flights of stairs. Tell me, you, you say the building didn't shake, but you obviously felt an explosion. Yes. What was going through your head when you felt this? It, it, that I'm, I'm making sure that everybody who were in my on my floor are, were out of the building, evacuated, and uh, a repeat of 1993 since I was there uh, the last time. That's right. You've worked in that building for 15 years. You were there in 1993 during the terrorist yep. attack. Then, let me go back to you going down 71 flights of stairs. How many people were with you? What did you encounter along the way? Uh, uh, there were about four people with me at that point since we are the last one to leave uh, the 71st floor. And in mid-level, uh, we encountered a young lady um, who was an handicap with crutches and uh, asking for help. And uh, between uh, the, the three of us, uh, we helped her down to the lower floors. Now, when you got downstairs to the bottom yes. of the building, what did you think? What was the first thing that you did? Uh, yeah, that, uh, we got some fresh air, not, yes, and uh, the police and uh, FBI agents were there guiding everyone out of the, you know, to move out of the building, and uh, so it was a relief, really. Describe the scene, what you saw when you looked outside. Fire. Fire. From uh, building number one, and uh, debris, a uh, piece of steel falling from that part of the building, the front part, uh, into the lower ground, yes, the ground was covered 
with uh, steel glass paper from those floors, yes. You had to be frightened. Yes, I was. Yeah. Describe that feeling. I mean, here you are. You're actually there. We're looking at it. We're looking at these pictures here, which are just horrific. This looks like downtown Beirut a yeah. few years ago. Rudolph Giuliani said it looks like it was bombed during World War II or something. Mm -hmm. What's going through your head? You're in the middle of all this. Well, um, I guess, you know, my, like I said, my primary responsibility was the evacuation of my floor. And before anything, I mean, uh, not, uh, not, I should not, not to panic and, you know, keep my head on my shoulder and making sure that everybody was out. Uh, was out. And that was the primary, uh, uh, the, pri the primary responsibility that I had. At Your that primary point. responsibility yeah. was to get everyone out. Now, what happened, where were you when the building collapsed, when Tower 2 collapsed? Uh, I was um, uh, in front of City Hall between City Hall and um, uh, JNR Music World. Which is about, what, three blocks about away? About three blocks away. And I'm looking up my building, number two, uh, in flame at the upper level. And then suddenly, I'm looking at the building collapsing like the black paper. Yeah. And, you know, that's really frightening me at that point. Excuse me, Rush Mitchell. Please sure. forgive me for interrupting, but apparently another building in the World Trade Center complex has just collapsed downtown. This is a live photograph of yet another building. Keep in mind that the World Trade Center complex, check me as I go here, yeah. please, sir, has seven buildings Correct. total. Has the two towers, they're gone. Yeah. Now, uh, we reported some time ago that two other buildings in the World Trade Center complex uh, were in danger of collapsing. One of those buildings has collapsed. There is an unconfirmed report, an unconfirmed report that is building five, but we do not know that. Uh, other sources are apparently reporting this building five in the complex, but we do not know that. What you are looking, this is, these are live pictures here. We've mixed live and tape, tried to make it clear to you throughout the day what's live, what's videotape. This is live tape, and you can tell it's an, at least another building collapsed because the density and the amount and the and frankly, the altitude of the smoke uh -huh. has increased so dramatically in that area. Keep in mind, and we've said this before, we say it again, what you're seeing are high shots. Now, here we're going to show you a videotape of the collapse itself. Describe that. Now we go to videotape the collapse of this building. It's amazing. A, a amazing, incredible pick your word for the third time today it's reminiscent of those pictures we've all seen too much on television before when a building was deliberately destroyed destroyed by well-placed dynamite to knock it down and so therefore this smoke that we were talking about and keep in mind their firemen policemen other workers down there working searching for people in the previously collapsed World Trade Center two towers uh, fates unknown. Uh, this is an incredible situation. This has never happened before in the United States. This is the most serious attack on U.S. soil uh, that's happened uh, since the Civil War, which of course was something completely different. Um, here on the front edge of the 21st century. And it's a good thing we held off any confirmation because we now are able to report uh, with confidence that Trade Center Building 7 is that building that collapsed, Correct. not Trade Center Building 5. Now, Trade Center Building 5, keep in mind, seven buildings in the World Trade Center, mm -hmm. two twin towers, they collapsed early this morning after being hit by planes. Then this afternoon, we were told buildings 5 and 7 were in danger of collapsing. Building 7 of the New York Trade Center, a, a large building in most other cities would be one of the largest buildings in town probably. Trade Center Building 7 has collapsed. CBS News correspondent and 60 Minutes 2 correspondent Scott Pelley is on the scene. Scott. 
Dan, uh, we were literally at the base of building number seven about an hour or so ago with a, a number of New York City firefighters and police officers. At that time, the building was fully involved in flame. There were large panes of glass crashing down into the street. And at that moment, the firefighters told us that there was a good chance that building number seven was going to collapse. That appears to be what has happened now. I, I don't know exactly how many stories the building is, Dan, but, but standing at the base of it, watching it burn about an hour ago, it looked to be something on the order of 50, 60 stories, as you said, a very, very large office building. And I don't know whether they were able to evacuate all of the emergency personnel before the collapse, but I can tell you that an hour ago, there were a number of firefighters and police officers in the area. They were watching building number seven burn because there was frankly nothing they could do about it. The inferno was huge. So much of the building was collapsing into the street bit by bit that they were unable to do anything with it. And now it seems that building number seven has finally collapsed at least the third building to fall in the World Trade Center today. Scott Pelley in Lower Manhattan. I don't believe Scott Pelley hears me, but Scott, on the off chance you do, do we know anything about uh, Trade Center Building 5, which was reported near collapse? Dan, I don't know, but when we were down, we were down about a block from the base of the World Trade Center towers about an hour ago. And there was a great deal of concern at that time from the firemen that building number seven was going to collapse, building number five was in danger of collapsing, and there is so little they can do to try to fight the fires in these buildings because the fires are so massive and so much of the buildings continue to fall into the street. You, when you're down there, Dan, you hear smaller secondary explosions going off every 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, and, and so it is an extremely dangerous place to be. Heavy, dense, black smoke choking the firefighters down there. Very little they can do to save these buildings. We don't know what the condition of building number five is at this moment. Scott Pelley, and we're told uh, Associated Press quotes authorities as saying that Building 7, the one you just saw collapse on videotape there, and this has happened within the last few minutes, that we're told that uh, the building had been evacuated. Sir, uh, you know the World Trade Center complex. What was Building 7? Do you know? <laughs> Solomon Smith Barney. Uh, Solomon Smith Barney. Say again. Solomon Smith Barney. Barney. So Solomon Brothers and Smith Barney were in that building, yeah, in that the headquartered building. there. Yes. But I want to emphasize yeah. that we're yeah. told that the building had been evacuated because it was in danger of collapsing at some time. I don't know. Uh, and in Building 5, which is reported this on... This is Morgan Stanley Building as well. Uh -huh. And you work in Morgan five, Stanley yeah. again. Building 5 is the operation for Morgan Thank Stanley. you very much. And we get back to the point which has been made earlier in the day, we repeat it here, that the the terrorists, whomever they may be, yes, there's a lot of talk about Osama bin Laden and others, but whomever this together, uh, did so a coordinated attack attacking the two symbols of America's superpower status. Uh, the financial district, the Twin Towers, now in hearing about these other buildings, part of the World Trade Center complex around the towers, being centers of American financial institutions, and then, of course, another of the hijacked planes um, hitting the Pentagon. Uh, not by coincidence, they chose these targets for their symbolism. Now, we're coming up to the top of the hour here in our continuing CBS News coverage from our world headquarters in New York. We do have coming in additional video, video that you haven't seen before taken by private individuals, and we're going to show you some of that as we pass the top of this next hour. We also, as we've been doing all day at the top of the hour and then at the half hour mark, try to bring you up to date on the situation, the latest information, and, and put a frame around this incredible day, a day that will leave an infamy uh, in United States history. There are no reliable even estimates of the number, the total number of dead and wounded uh, in New York at this time, and it may be quite some time before we have that information. Another building in the World Trade Complex has collapsed. You are watching continuing CBS News coverage of the attack on America. Dan Rather at CBS News World Headquarters in New York as our continuous coverage of this day uh, goes on. 
Now, we have new videotape of the attack on the World Trade Center. Let me caution you uh, that we, we're giving this to you more or less raw. Uh, this is strong material, and some of the language you will hear. We want you know, to hear the sight and the sound of what happened this morning, but unfortunately on this particular piece of tape, and one of the pieces of tape you're about to see, some of the language is, um, is strong. So if we can roll that videotape now or as soon as possible. One of the Trade Center buildings has been hit at a high floor, maybe above floor 90, by one aircraft. That would be American Flight 11. Now look at the plane coming in the middle. Oh, what a picture. That plane hit the second building at a much lower level. First plane hit very high up on the one tower, maybe floor 90 or above. Second plane at what? I don't know, maybe floor 71. 71, 71 and up. Yeah. 71 and up. Yeah. You may want to run that videotape again. This we just got into our news newsroom, oh this videotape. And not long after this, first one and the other, these towers collapsed, and now we've had Building 7 of the World Trade Center, where Solomon Brothers, Smith Barney, uh, had their headquarters. We're going to re-rack that videotape and show it to you again. Uh, as we do the re-racking, say that we don't have uh, any confirmed figures on the number of people killed at the Pentagon or the number of people wounded there in Washington where a hijacked plane hit. We have no idea of, of the New York fatalities. Here again is this photograph. The building on the left is about to be hit by the hijacked Listen. incoming plane. What the hell is that? Holy fuck! Oh my God! Oh my God! Jesus fucking Christ! Chris, are you fucking... Yeah, no, don't touch it. <laughs> A ball of flame envelops the second of the World Trade Center towers. Oh, no. oh my God! Untold death and destruction. As after being hit by the second plane, the second tower eventually collapsed after the, you know, both of these twin towers collapsed. Now building seven in the World Trade Center after being evacuated, we're told, collapsed. In the debris below, people still trapped. This is new videotape that had not been seen before. Dateline Washington, the Pentagon now says, and we've checked and double checked this, 100 people believed killed or injured. There's no differentiation. We still don't know how many killed, how many injured at the Pentagon, but the Defense Department says its best available information is 100 people believed killed or injured at the Pentagon. And while the Pentagon symbolically was one of the two targets today, that the death, the wounding, and the damage at the Pentagon, nothing to compare with what's happened with the World Trade Center complex. Paramedics waiting to be sent into the rubble today were told that once the smoke clears, it's going to be massive bodies, quote, unquote. That's Brian Stark, an ex-Navy paramedic who volunteered to help. Stark said paramedics were told that, quote, hundreds of police and firefighters are missing from the ranks of those sent in to respond to the initial crash. Now, mind you, this is only one person speaking. Uh, New York police and firemen rushed to the scene this morning, as is their destiny when they volunteer for such work. Uh, they place themselves in harm's way. And it has been thought throughout the day that certainly some police and firemen uh, would turn up missing, and according to this paramedic, he says he was told, quote, that hundreds of police and firefighters are missing. Let me caution you, we do not know that for a fact. And as we've said repeatedly, and I say again now without apology, sometimes the first information you get from the scene turns out to be wrong information. We do our best to nail down the facts. We'd rather be last with information than be wrong. We try to give the information to you as quickly as we can get it. In this kind of situation, I know you will understand when I say there's no way that we can do it perfectly. We do our very best. And our number one job, the number one job here is accuracy. Now, among the other facts uh, that we know is that the president is uh, on his way to Washington. I have to say I don't really know that to be a fact. 
But that's been officially announced that he's on his way to Washington. The president will be addressing the nation tonight from Washington, we're told. Will he be speaking to the White House? We do not know that. Now, we're in effect handling uh, all kinds of hot information and material here. We have, I'm told, more videotape that's never been seen before today. That you saw a minute ago about that s second plane hitting the World Trade Center had not been seen before. We have additional videotape now of what happened here in New York earlier this morning. Watch this. This is, I haven't seen this before. I'm seeing it for the first time as you do. The first building hit at high, at high floor by the first plane is in smoke. The second building has just been hit by the plane. I beg your pardon. As you, it was the collapse of the first tower. Now let's go back over this videotape we've not seen before. The, the tower that was hit by the first plane is still standing. It won't be for long. Remember, this all happened this morning between 9 and 11 a.m. In the second building, now you saw, we'll show these videotapes to you in sequence. First, you have the videotape of the plane coming, and it was coming at pretty high speed, much greater speed than the first plane that hit. We have videotape showing the building hit, and then this second videotape taken from some distance of the first of the towers to collapse. Perhaps we can re-rack that videotape at some point. Strange, eerie, I used the word, if it is a word, Dante-esque earlier in the day, how instead of a ball of flame going up and great billows of smoke going upward, they came downward into and toward the earth itself. But that's because of building collapse. Now, this is the collapse the first of the towers to collapse. We just secured this video. The whole building's gone. The whole building's gone. Indeed. Holy fucking Jesus! We do apologize for the language on the videotape. Um, now, one can understand uh, people seeing this incredible sight. And when you see this, you're reminded why everyone in authority is saying we should be prepared for eventually finding out many dead, many seriously wounded, and at this hour, as night has not yet fallen, but begins to creep in on New York City, there are people trapped in the rubble. And when the third building collapsed, World Trade Center building number seven, uh, people uh, who are making efforts to save those people in the rubble who were trapped in there, some of those people uh, were in peril as that Trade Center building number seven collapsed within the last hour, hour and a half. Now what you're going to see next is videotape of the second World Trade Center building collapsing from a different view than you've seen it before. This is again new videotape. One of the World Trade Center buildings has already collapsed. The second, the actual first one to hit by the plane is still standing. It is a smoking ruin in its upper floors. These World Trade Center towers have absorbed a tremendous shock of fast flying airliners. Highly inflammable aviation fuel. The one building has collapsed. Oh no! Oh no! And once it starts to go, how quickly it went. It's going right now. It's falling. These home videos are taken from across the way from a place that once had a spectacular view of a spectacular New York skyline. And the smoke told the story. 
Scott Pelley will bring us up to date on the situation in lower Manhattan. Scott, it's an unsettling moment to see, again, different views of those buildings collapsing and indeed the aircraft hitting the second building. But what's the situation down there right now? Dan, the smoke that you see rising behind me now is from World Trade Center building number seven, which collapsed about 15 minutes ago. This is a, a very large building. It's 47 stories tall, at least half a block wide. This would have been a catastrophe in its own right, Dan. Uh, the building has been on fire all day since the initial attack about an hour ago. I was down there with a CBS News camera crew, and we were talking to firefighters and police officers. Building number seven was completely involved in flame. Flames were shooting out of the building. Large panes of glass were falling into the street. The firefighters explained that there was nothing they could do to try to put the fire out because it was just simply far too dangerous. And they warned us an hour ago that the building might collapse. And indeed, that is what has come to pass. Apparently, some of the city's emergency operations were located in that building. The fire department is telling us now that they have lost some of their communications at this point. The building, of course, being on fire, being at the scene of the attack, had been evacuated much, much earlier. There was no one in the building at the time that it collapsed about 15 minutes ago. However, I will tell you that when we left there an hour ago, there were several New York City police officers and firefighters down there making sure that no one else came into the area. Dan? Scott Pelley on the scene reporting live uh, from Lower Manhattan. Now we're going to show you again videotape of World Trade Center Building 7. This is the one that just collapsed within the last hour and a half, uh, two hours at the outside. This was a 47-story tall building. Uh, this is a scene on the ground just after this building came tumbling down and yet new bellows of the horrible smoke and the stench from the smoke began to fill lower Manhattan all anew. Clear shot, please. this videotape uh, for you because we're, what, what we intend to show you and we have on videotape is the collapse that World Trade Center uh, building number seven which housed uh, Solomon Brothers and Smith Barney. I look away because our friend here who's an eyewitness and who worked in the building and by the way let's get a picture here. another you know he wouldn't call himself a hero but here's a man in our studio who's given us some eyewitness reports here today who calmly got together, led people out of the building, it was his responsibility, he took it upon himself to get people out and then get himself out. Uh, was there actual panic as you did then? There were panic among the staff, yes. Uh, but uh, the important thing, everybody got out on time before. Well, you won't say it, but I will. You got everybody out. Yeah. Uh, David Martin is outside the Pentagon, David. And the, uh, the U.S. is trying to do uh, two very different things here simultaneously. One is to hunker down and button up and protect against the possibility of still another attack. And that's why uh, the Pentagon has put all of its uh, bases on the highest state of alert. And the State Department has put all American embassies around the world on the highest state of alert. But at the same time, the U.S. wants to create an impression, at least, of a quick return to normalcy, and that is one of the reasons why the president is coming back to Washington tonight. You know, he spent the day uh, moving about uh, from a military base to military base as much as he would in the event of a, uh, a nuclear war. Um, that now is ended, and they are uh, bringing the president back to Washington to try and create this impression of a return to normalcy. But obviously, as you can see behind me, we are a long, long way from normal. One of the obvious questions here is, who did this? And the early suspicions are focused on Osama bin Laden, the uh, terrorist who has, seems to have made it his life's calling to attack Americans around the world. And in this case, I think, uh, in contrast to previous cases, there is very little doubt 
that there will be some form of military retaliation. What form it will take and when it might happen, I think it's much too early to uh, tell, but I think uh, it is all but inevitable. Uh, David Martin, two questions. The last quote we had from any official at the Pentagon was that 100 people were believed killed or injured. Any later information about that? The only number I've heard, Dan, which is, is 20 dead, but no one expected it to uh, uh, end there. Uh, the uh, services that had offices in that part of the building have asked all of the people assigned there uh, to call in so they know who made it out. And there are still, uh, among all the services, hundreds of unaccounted for, but you don't know uh, if that's uh, because they didn't make it out or simply because they haven't called in. Uh, but if you just take a uh, fully loaded uh, commercial airliner, uh, you know that the, uh, the death toll is going to go much higher uh, than 20, no matter who was uh, caught in the building. Well, that's a good point. And w the belief is that... Uh American Flight 77 headed from Dulles Airport near Washington to Los Angeles, a Boeing 757. This is the plane that's believed to have crashed uh, in the Pentagon, had 58 passengers and six crew. And while one might hope and pray that somebody among those 58 passengers and six crew survived, it seems highly unlikely. So there, right there, you would have, uh, you know, in the 60s, uh, the number of people dead, killed at the Pentagon. And the wife of U.S. Solicitor General Theodore Olson was aboard the jetliner that crashed into the Pentagon. She called him as the plane was being hijacked. She twice called her husband and described some details of the hijacking, including, now this is Barbara Olson, an attorney, very intelligent woman, the wife of the U.S. Solicitor General, the new one, Theodore Olson. She said that the attackers were using knife-like instruments. Uh, that when she called her husband, she said the attackers, this is on the plane, that would have been the uh, American Airlines Flight 77. She said that the attackers were using knife-like instruments. Now, the officials who quoted the, this conversation to the woman's husband uh, declined to give any further uh, details of the conversation. Uh, in a brief telephone interview from his home, Theodore Olson said his wife was on the plane and that uh, they crashed in the Pentagon, and he said, I wish it wasn't so, but it is. Olson argues President Bush's cases before the Supreme Court. We're going to go back to David Martin at the Pentagon. Uh, David, I understand you have some additional information or insight, well, and then I have an additional question for you, please. Uh, you, were, you were talking about the plane that crashed into the Pentagon. Someone made the point to me that all of these planes uh, were cross-country flights that had just taken off, meaning they were all carrying full loads of fuel, which would obviously increase the destruction uh, that they caused when they crashed into a building. Uh, whether that was part of the plan or whether it just worked out that way, we, of course, don't know. But it would uh, certainly indicate, uh, at least initially, that considerable thought and planning went into this attack. Indeed, David, uh, David including uh, that they hit the World Trade Center at the height of morning rush hour, right at 9 o'clock, first one building, then the other, right at the very height of rush hour here in New York City. David, stand by, because I have some questions about possible U.S. responses. You say, you know, the U.S. will respond. Uh, the how and why of that I'd like to discuss with you. But first, uh, we want to go through a sequence uh, that uh, of pictures of what happened here in New York today at the World Trade Center, including uh, two pieces of videotape that uh, CBS News obtained exclusively and we've shown only in the last half hour or so. So the sequence of events uh, that will not necessarily be in order, but this to review for you and give you the latest picture information we have is the way it was this morning between 9 and 11 a.m. Uh, New York time, Eastern time. One plane has hit the upper tier, but watch the left-hand corner of your screen. The second World Trade Tower has not yet been hit. It's about 9 a.m. Here comes the plane, very high speed. Cuts almost through the building. Great balls of fire. Tremendous bellows of smoke. The voices you hear in the background, the people in the home or the place where these pictures were taken. So the second building was hit. Now, you note the plane went in at about 
that aircraft hit that tower at floor about 71. The first building was hit, you know, 90 or above, say. So both buildings are now smoke and flame. Now, different view. Both buildings are aflame. All right, and then the building that was hit second comes tumbling down. That was the one where the airplane came in particularly quickly and hit the building at about floor 71. The Chrysler building in the background. Now the second tower, which was actually hit first by American Flight 11, begins to crumble. Disappear. And since then, the, the most recent collapse, which happened just a short while ago, Building 7, a 47 story building as part of the World Trade Center complex, collapsed. That building had been, we were told, completely evacuated. But the fate of people on the ground, including rescue workers, as it came tumbling down, we simply don't know. But it had been threatening to collapse, it had been on the verge of collapse for a long while, so perhaps, perhaps, most of the area had been evacuated, but who could have anticipated this kind of incredibly dense and fast-moving smoke, which covers many blocks in New York. And like some white monster, came quickly down side streets and major thoroughfares. Now stay with me here, stay with us here. Our CBS, this is another, see the plane? This is another view, more videotape. This plane. Against a backdrop of gentle blue sky, a terrorist arrow pierces the heart of a city and a nation. Oh. oh. Those two sequences we should see again. One more horrifying than the next. And we will show you. This was a United Airlines flight, 175. Some of this video has just now uh, become available. And in the aftermath, well, if you've been with us, you know what happens. We're going to try to re rack. Uh, uh, that's the opposite side of the second tower hit. You know, we had different views during the day, but this was photographed from that side of the building. Now we're going to recue that sequence of videotape. This includes new videotape material obtained by CBS News over the last hour, hour and a half. We have shown some of it. Now, this is the latest new video we have. You see the plane coming in high speed, aiming for the mid level, and hits it. the heart of a city and a nation. That was the second flight, United Flight 175, and this is a reverse side of the building. See, the plane actually pierced the building. There were several and angles. Virtually came out the other side. The and yet another view: the plane hitting. It's almost like the building swallowed the plane. Yeah. Yes. And here you see this aircraft below. Did you see that? All right. You had to be looking closely in the right-hand side to see it hit in there. And indeed, Russ Mitchell said it's almost as if the building swallowed the plane and then belched back up. Well, nobody's ever seen photographs like that because nothing like this has ever happened before. We go to David Martin to put it down. Dan, we were talking earlier about uh, trying to give the appearance of a return to uh, normalcy. Well, now we have one other uh, appearance of normalcy, which is the fact that uh, Defense Secretary Rumsfeld will give a, a briefing later this evening in the briefing room in the Pentagon. In other words, we're going to be allowed to go back into the Pentagon, and obviously, uh, as that is designed in part uh, to give a show that uh, you can uh, you can damage the Pentagon, but you can't sink it. That uh, business continues in there as normal. Now, obviously one of the pieces of business that's going to be continuing now is planning for some sort of uh, military retaliation, although I think it's much too early for us to really uh, have any good idea what that might look like. 
David Martin, uh, we're going to go to Bob Orr, who has some new information in just a moment. But once in the Far East, uh, an intelligence operative who was talking about revenge for things, terrorist events, used the quote, he said it was an old Oriental expression, revenge is best served cold, which the thought was that you don't want to enrage, lash out immediately. Now, given the fact, and it is a fact, that after the 1998 attacks on the U.S. embassies in East Africa, uh, the United States government responded in fairly quickly with two separate cruise missile attacks, uh, many missiles, at Sudan and Afghanistan. My question to you, David Martin, when you talk about some kind of retaliation is, is certain, what has been the thinking before this happened about the advisability of responding immediately or waiting and, in effect, was serve, uh, serving revenge cold? Well, they have two lines. One is that we will uh, strike in a time and place of our choosing, and that uh, supports the argument that you don't have to do uh, something right away. But after those uh, cruise missile attacks on the Sudan and Afghanistan, the argument was that that was not retaliation, that was preemption, because Osama bin Laden was planning further attacks against the U.S., and they had to disrupt his operations. So I can see that that argument would uh, apply here as well. The U.S. could say it has intelligence that uh, this was not all the attacks that were planned, that Osama bin Laden had further attacks planned, and they had to act quickly to uh, upset these plans. On the other hand, I can see them wanting to take their time and get it right so that we don't have another largely ineffectual strike as we did following the, uh, the embassy bombings. Uh, the, the strikes did not get Osama bin Laden and obviously did not have any lasting impact on his uh, operations since uh, he has been behind most of the threats that uh, the U.S. has had to react to over the years. And, of course, if uh, the evidence indicates that he was behind this as well, then, of course, uh, we really uh, didn't do much to stop him with that earlier strike. And I think all that would argue for some uh, very large military response, perhaps including going after him on the ground, which, of course, is always risky because of casualties. But I think the uh, proportion of the offense, I mean, let's face it, this was the, uh, the worst sneak attack on America since Pearl Harbor. And when you put it in that context, I think uh, the American public would support taking casualties to go after the person who was behind that. But all that's still pretty far down the road, Dan. Indeed, David Martin speaking live from the Pentagon. President Bush will address the nation tonight. CBS News will cover it live. We'll be staying on the air live. Very quickly, Russ Mitchell has some new information about attending to the wounded in New York. That's right, Dan. The Health and Human Services Department has activated a national medical emergency system. This is an unprecedented move that will dispatch about 7,000 volunteer doctors, nurses, pharmacists, and other pharmacists of the medical staff to areas affected by Tuesday's attacks, which, of course, would be New York and Washington. The timetable for this, Dan, I'm told, is immediately. Rush Mitchell, 7,000 volunteer do doctors sought from around the nation to come uh, help um, in New York with what is a massive uh, healing and tending to the dead and wounded operation, which will go on for weeks, if indeed not months. Now, Bob Orr in Washington has some, a, a new insight on this information from Barbara Olson, who was aboard one of the planes hijacked about uh, knife-wielding or uh, knife-type instruments uh, in the aircraft, and Orr's going to put that in perspective for you just at the top of the hour. Now, at the top of every hour and at the half-hour mark, we try to bring you up to date on the latest video we have, the, the latest pictures we have, the latest information that we have, and we'll be doing that just past the top of the hour on many of these CBS stations. Uh, the aircraft involved this morning, American Airlines Flight 11, Boston to Los Angeles. That it is a horrific scene unprecedented in the history of our nation. Terror attacks carried out on several targets in the U.S., and dozens of New Englanders are among the victims. Freedom itself was attacked this morning by a faceless coward, and freedom will be defended. We have team coverage of the attacks and their aftermath on this special edition of WBZ4 News. 
Good evening, I'm Joe Shortsleeve. Tonight, Americans are watching in horror at a series of events.